questions, we will have two quick comments by Dean Carlin from the Yale Economics Department and myself. Um, so thank you, Jeffrey. That was um, very interesting to hear. So I have two basic thoughts, and they're going to segue into two slightly longer thoughts, but I'll give you the basic introduction. Goals are great. I love goals. Two things, though, that I think we need to ask. One is, how do we get to those goals? Um, having a goal alone is, 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 is good. I mean, we need that, too. But what is the actual policy we put forward to get to that goal? And the second is, do goals actually work? Is it actually changing behavior having the goal? Um, so I want to give you an example of the first that is an example of an approach to dealing with extreme poverty. And it's an approach that, I, that um, has a lot of elements that I think are, are near and dear to things that Jeffrey has written about in other contexts, about a, the basic problem of being extremely poor is not as simple as just one thing. It's not just, I'm sick, get me health care, and boom, there you go. It's not just, I'm in an asset trap, a debt trap, or or a, a liquidity trap, and so just get me some assets, and boom, I'm out, right? That you have five market failures all happening at the same time, and if you solve four of them, you're still screwed, so you have to solve all five. So it's a, kind of this big push approach. Now, some of the things that Jeffrey's been pushing on is a big push, what I would describe at a macro level. This is taking that idea, but saying, no, 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 we're not going to touch the macro side. We're going to go at the micro level. We're going to go household by household and do a big push at the micro level. And these are some of the results of what we found. So first of all, just to give you the, this is a very, very simple, explanation is that you have all these various components and this program that we're dealing with provided asset transfers, health care, savings accounts, training, weekly visits to households to help them monitor what they're doing and, they're, and to build an economic livelihood. And the basic argument is that, you know, the, um, the whole is greater than some of the parts. One thing, I didn't put this up here, but what I learned a long time ago is it's important to spell some correctly when you put that on your slides. I at one point put up the whole is greater than S-O-M-E of the parts, which has a very <laughs> different meaning <laughs> and is um, fairly obvious. <laughs> um, and I mean some S-U-M. Okay, so, you know, but what we're doing with these programs is, you know, we're measuring, we're measuring the impact compared to a counterfactual using a randomized trial so that we can actually as assess what, what actually has happened to people's <laughs> lives as compared to what would have happened had their lives not experienced these programs, this program did not exist. And this is fundamentally different than just saying how have their lives changed, right? Because we know that, that lots of things are gonna change people's lives, good rainfall, bad rainfall, good economics, bad economics, et cetera, et cetera. So there's outside forces, there's selection bias, there's all these issues. And so by setting up a randomized trial, we're able to, um, to deal with that. So what have we found? First of all, we've done this across 10 sites. Um, Ghana, Haiti, Honduras, two, three, well, India should be two, um, in India. Ethiopia, Pakistan, Peru, Yemen. Yeah, so the randomized evaluations are in eight of those, not Haiti and not the third India one. Um, and so first of all, let me just explain very succinctly the theory of change here is, you know, you have several market failures, but you provide you know, you provide health care, you provide consumption support, weekly bundles of food so there's enough caloric intake to have the energy to deal with whatever the livelihood that's provided and the livelihood is provided. Each place is a little bit different, context specific. In some places, in, in Ghana, for instance, um, we gave out shoats, which at, when I first was told this by my team that we were giving out shoats, I got really nervous that we had mated goats and sheep and produced shoats and we were distributing them. It turns out, no, it just means that we were trying to promote diversification and we gave two goats and two sheep, but everyone just called them shoats. Um, in, in Honduras, we gave away chickens. Um, and the we here is, I'm, I'm speaking generally, it's either us or our partner. In, in the case of Ghana, it was us, Innovations for Poverty Action, that we're implementing with a local NGO. In the case of Honduras, it was PLAN, different, different partners in different places. <coughs> so the theory of change is you give this asset, this asset generates um, income, if it works, and, and then with that income, they can start saving and building for their own future. And um, so the Honduras side is an interesting test of that because this chickens got sick and died, and, and which is actually a total failure when we look at the results. And so this is the effect of total annual consumption per capita, two years and then three years after for the different sites. We don't have the three year yet for Peru and Ghana in here. But as you can see, in, in Bandan, which is in West Bengal in India, it looks quite good, nice, positive, big impacts. And the three years, this is a year and a, a year, 
in a, a year and a little bit after the program has left. No more contact with the clients, and the program is persisting and sustaining. Ethiopia, the same, same really huge positive results. Ghana, it's positive, it's, not, it's noisy, so there are other outcomes that look good for Ghana, income, the consumption was not as good. Honduras actually is a negative point estimate, okay? And ironically, unfortunately, this is a failure from a program perspective, but it's actually an ironic success from a research perspective. The theory of change is that you have to transfer an asset which is going to make income. Turns out, if you transfer an asset which gets sick and dies, it doesn't help people. So it's actually, in a, in a very bizarre way, it's, it's, it's consistent with the theory of change that we're testing. It's an unfortunate one as a humanitarian. Obviously, we're not happy about that. But from a research perspective, it does add to the robustness of the results to show that that missing link is actually fairly important. And they did all those other things, but it wasn't enough because the asset that was transferred got sick and died. Um, Pakistan looks good, and Peru also looks good. When you look at whether this is cost effective, right, I want to know. I want to compare this to sticking the money in a bank account, taking 5%, well, not 5% these days, but sticking it in a bond, earns 5% and transfer the money. Because that's, to me, the counterfactual exercise. If we want to redistribute wealth, that's the other thing we can do. This cost $1,000 a household. This was not cheap. When I first got involved in these programs, I was pessimistic that this would prove cost effective. Because it was so, I didn't doubt that the benefits would be there, but I doubted they would be there relative to the costs. Turns out, you take $1,000, stick it in a bank account that generates, or a bond, $50 that you can transfer to the household forever and ever and ever, this is better. So that's the right thing to think about it as just redistribution of wealth. So this is one of the reasons why as the scale up that we're working on, we're very much keen to work with governments that are doing social safety net programs, thinking about redistribution of wealth and, tr and cash transfers and saying, you know, here's another approach that can help the extreme poor even more dollar for dollar. So there's lots of questions here. In some sense, you might say to me, I didn't test the thing I told you I set out to test. Right? I told you, ah, oh, it's five market failures all happening at once, you gotta do this big push, but I didn't show you that it fails with three of them and four of them. And that is part of what we're working on in the next phase of these studies is to start teasing apart the model and see, is there a way of doing this more cheaply or is there one of those components that wasn't actually necessary? So that's my example of saying it's great to have goals, but how are we gonna get there? And how are we gonna get there? When we're dealing with things that are at the micro level, there's things that can be done with randomized trials. There's obviously things that are out there that people are working on that are not type, types of things you can do as a randomized trial for. They're working at the infrastructure level, at the country level, and it's a different space, right? But when we're dealing with things like this, which is a lot of what we're actually talking about, then these are the types of things that work very well to use this type of rigorous approach. Okay, so that's, that's my pitch on attribution for fine to have a goal, what do we do to get there? Second is I'm gonna talk about does the goal matter? So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna read you from this. Um, actually, last time I was at a conference with Jeffrey, I wrote this, no offense, in the audience while I was listening to you. Um, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, physically not capable of focusing on one thing at a time, as the people who work with me can, can vouch for that in the audience here. So this is an op-ed that I wrote. I never did anything with it because I was kind of waiting for it to be a right moment in the news, and I, and I frankly forgot about it until I was invited to be on this panel, and so I, I found it in my email to myself from, from um, back then. So here goes. A modest proposal. The committee to define the post-MDG goals was just announced. I have a modest proposal to the new committee. Randomize which metrics are chosen. Here's why. Conventional wisdom suggests that we'll likely hit some but not all of the 2015 goals. Although as Deaton showed a while ago, some goals were met before the race began, depending on what data were used. What have the MDGs gotten us? Um, as Esther Duflo said, Esther actually was Jeffrey's research assistant before she got her PhD, I believe. That's how she got her start was, is that right, Jeff? Right. It, working in Russia for Jeff many, many years ago, although she's not that young, so it wasn't, she's quite young, so it wasn't that long ago. So as Esther Duflo said, it isn't like if we miss them, someone will come down from Mars and hold us accountable. Some evaluations have focused strictly on MDG goals, um, but has our aid and related efforts, and many would say growth through capitalism, of course, deserves higher billing than related efforts? Has, it, has that made any progress? Is the aid what has caused us to get there, or is it growth and other things which were happening regardless? But politicians are people too. Behavioral economists and psychologists long ago showed that setting goals can help individuals obtain goals for weight loss, for finishing annoying work tasks, Sometimes those goals are process goals. I commit to dieting, I commit to eating fewer carbs, or I commit to losing weight. Uh, maybe it's I commit to study, I don't commit to getting an A, but I do commit to studying 14 hours a day. So you can commit to process changes as well as, as, well as have aspirations and goals. Um, 
Politicians may be the same. Maybe they need a goal in order to buckle down and allocate scarce resources to a social problem. So the next wave of MDGs is expanding. Many didn't like the last ones if they omitted their pet outcome measure. The new ones are on track to solve that problem through goal proliferation. At least this is last I heard, so this may be, may be not the most recent from what Jeffrey mentioned about there being only 10. Last time I, last time I was talking with people that were on the committee, there was talk of proliferation to 20, 30, 40 goals. Um, they're also talking about goal, setting goals of zero, like zero on things which um, kind of scares me as a side point. Um, if I, that's like me setting a goal of saying I'm going to sleep no more than two hours a week for the rest of my life so that I can work more and play more. It's just not realistic. And what's gonna end up happening is I'm gonna give up on my goal. Um, and so you do want to set realistic goals. Um, I think that's important for having the goal work. So I have a modest proposal. Take the top 40 outcomes, randomly choose 20. Keep the other 20 under secret lock and key. And let's see if this goal setting works for international aid, not just for losing weight and cramming for finals. If anyone is wondering, I'm just joking. The sample size is way too small. <laughs> One would need to randomly assign goals to countries in order to have sufficient power. There would be spillovers. I don't think it would actually work. That's all. So I wanted to make four quick points about what we can learn from the Millennium Development <coughs> Goal experience. And I think that's worth keeping in mind as we go forward into the sustainable development formulation. So the first one is that I think we should commit ourselves to defining precisely in advance the goals and targets that we are committing ourselves to as well as the methods by which progress toward these targets is to be measured and assessed. And that is one thing that I think went wrong with the MDGs, that during the MDG period repeatedly, the formulation of the goals and the methods for measuring these goals, tracking progress, were actually changed. I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but here's one example from uh, last year, 2012, where the FAO changed its methodology for counting the hungry and undernourished. So you can see here the numbers that they delivered for 2011 and the numbers that they delivered for 2012. And you can see that the hungry people increased by 157 million in the year 1990 with the new methodology. And the number of hungry people also decreased quite substantially for the years 2008, 2009, 2010. Of course, the net result of both these changes was that we have a much more rosy looking trend and so now we are pretty much on target with hunger, whereas before it looked absolutely horrific. We had been going in the wrong direction. The goal, by the way, is to half the proportion of hungry people. Here's another example with the World Bank's poverty line. Uh, Jeff talked earlier about the $1.25 poverty line, which is the one that's now being used. But if you look at the original formulation of the MDGs, it was in terms of a dollar a day, and that was a dollar in 1985 currency. Now, don't think that they raised the poverty line. The very opposite is the case. They lowered the poverty line because inflation in the intervening years between 1985 and 2005 was a lot more than 25%. And so it turns out that with a lower poverty line, you actually get better looking results. That's a well-known fact that extreme poverty, the most extreme poverty has come down faster than severe poverty. So here you can see uh, a dollar a day, which is what we started with, would have been a dollar 81.5 per day in 2005 currency. And we're actually using now a much lower poverty line of a dollar 25. Here is the relationship about how we are doing with regard to uh, this poverty goal. And you can see that if we take the, the dollar and 25 poverty line, we look splendid. We are 22.4% ahead of target for in 2010, and we've already in fact achieved the 2015 goal. 
But if we took the $1.81 poverty line, we would be behind target. And if we took an even higher poverty line, we would be even further behind. So it matters a lot. And so it's, it's, it's just not a good thing to have reduced the poverty line and thereby made it so much easier to achieve the target of halving the proportion of poor people. Raises, of course, suspicions also of why this new methodology was introduced or why we didn't take something that is closer at least to the $1 a day 1985 poverty line. The second and related commitment that we should make, I think, is to leave the monitoring of progress to independent experts. Don't let the World Bank do it. Don't let the FAO do it. Not because these are bad people, but because these are people who are politically exposed and vulnerable. They're under pressure. They get their money from governments. And so if governments tell them these numbers look awful and what you have, the FAO, is absolutely inconsistent with the World Bank's poverty numbers, which are good looking and yours are bad looking, do something. They are in no position to resist. They need the government subsidies or funding for their efforts. And they're also often charged with accomplishing these goals and so are clearly not in an unbiased, impartial position in tracking progress. So let's have independent experts and give the world confidence that what is being reported with regard to these goals is actually real. The third thing is that we should not think of these goals as detached or disembodied. What we've had with these goals is sort of something that really borderline goals, I would call them wishes with my understanding of English, right? It's sort of you put something out there and say, poverty ought to go down by one half. But for a goal, you need an agent. You need to tell us whose goal this is supposed to be, who has supposed to be responsible for actually accomplishing this goal. And in this regard, the MDGs did rather poorly. This was left completely unspecified. And so there was all this pushing and shoving behind the scenes where governments were intimating that it was others, right? In the end, the rich country governments made it appear that it was the poor countries or each country itself had to get its numbers down. And so the poorest countries were put in charge of getting poverty down from 80% to 40%, whereas the rich countries had the responsibility of getting their poverty down from half a percent to a quarter of a percent. And that, of course, is a very unfair allocation of responsibilities. So we need to say more, not only about the goals, that is to say, what do we want to achieve, but also about who is supposed to do what in order to make it happen. And then the fourth thing is that we should think of these development goals not only in the context of aid policies, but across the board with regard to all institutional arrangements, all major policies that we have at the national and international level, because very often these work at cross purposes with each other. We have trade agreements or we have climate agreements or we have no climate agreements. And uh, finance agreements, they all have important consequences on the distribution of income and wealth, on the distribution of health and sickness in the world. And however, we take the goals uh, to focus on aid. We have this compensatory little mechanism where we spend money on trying to do something for the poor, often making a lot of damage, producing a lot of harm, in the main institutional architecture and then only stemming some of that damage, shielding the poor from some of that damage through the aid industry. So I'm pleading for a mainstreaming where in all different constructions of institutional arrangements, policy setting at the international and also national level, we take the MDGs or the SDGs in the next period into account and at least carefully study what the likely impact is going to be of this, that, or the other way of arranging these institutions. Thanks. <laughs>